So last time we have started discussing the continuous spectra, which is uh, obviously primarily relevant for discussing, say, a free particle, for instance. And in that context, we have introduced the concept of position operator. And we have also introduced a few e e cursory remarks in relation with its philosophical context. Well, they are coordinates. In, in principle, when you, if you are really de trying to define a classical description of the universe, you need a set of reference frame, set of coordinates, so a reference frame. So it is more or less implicitly obvious that you, when you even move from classical to quantum, and these position coordinates now becomes position operators, should be commuting set of operators. It is one of those implicit assumptions. Being a coordinate, because notice that I haven't really introduced any kind of proof for the commutativity or compatibility of the three components of a position operator. We have started with the one dimension, introduced the eigenvectors and eigenvalues uh, associated with the position operator, and also said, uh, commented upon, based on the previous information, that X being a Hermitian operator, eigenvalues are real, and eigenvectors are orthogonal, corresponding to the different eigenvalues. But as it is continuous, this is complicated mathematics continuum mathematics come into the game and orthogonality is to be understood in the Dirac delta sense, which is really not a function but a distribution and it's a very subtle issue. And also the completeness sums are to be understood in the sense of integral. These are not trivial uh, matters in, in the field of mathematics, but we have no intention of going through existence theorems and we are just going to use all those uh, nice theorems provided ma by the mathematicians. But the underlying feature in here is that position operator is just a generalization of the coordinates from the coordinates in the reference in a specially chosen reference frame in the classical case and the three components of the position operator are commuting. Therefore we can define a common eigenvector associated with all the three components, x, y, z in the Cartesian language, or x1, x2, x3 in a more uh, abstract language. So uh, let me write that and let me move to the conjugate operator, which is the momentum. So position operator I define with the capital letter. Remember that we had uh, introduced a convention saying that capital letters are associated with the operators and small letters are the corresponding eigenvalues and eigenvector labels. Okay. So the, we started with the one dimensional case and generalize it to the three dimension. The, the dimension we live in, of course, you could think of generalizing it to any arbitrary dimension. I, one, two, and three. And based on the completeness, not only for the one dimensional operators eigenvectors, but also three dimensional operators eigenvectors, so that you can really express everything in terms of those basis vectors. That's implicitly meaning, implying that these are commuting operators or compatible set of operators. You may say, why do the, does the professor feel so uneasy about such a trivial statement? It's not a trivial statement. I'm trying to point out an important uh, issue in relation with the position operator, particularly when you move into higher levels of quantization, quantum field theory, eventually I hope you do, you'll see that uh, the position operator it doesn't have a unique and unambiguous definition. It's a difficult entity, really. <coughs> So it means that if I define a eigenvalue equa a equation of this sort for any i really, 
Again, I is as before, one, two, three. What is this really? This is x1, x2, x3 in principle. It is a common set of eigenvectors for all the three components. It, it, I don't mean to say x1 and x1. This is a common set of eigenvectors. So pay attention to the notation as it stands. Okay, fine. Now when we are done with this, then we have to obviously move into the momentum operator. You, of course, immediately say that, ah, you are using the correspondence principle. Yes, I do. Well, because in the classical physics, there are uh, those important observables. There, the dynamical variables, position and momenta here we have the position and momentum observables. And we have already convinced ourselves that they are the Hermitian operators to have the real eigenvalues and all that. So when we really move into discussion of momentum operator, there are two pathways. As commented upon briefly by the book also, you could really directly subscribe to the correspondence principle and say that here are the dynamical variables in the classical mechanics, x and p's for each degree of freedom, and here are the sort of Poisson brackets, if I really work in the Hamiltonian formulation rather than Newton or other. There are several equivalent formulations of classical mechanics, as you know. Then uh, these are canonical pairs. You know what canonicality means in classical uh, physics, then uh, you look at the uh, features of uh, the, uh, those canonical pairs for each degree of freedom, qi and pi, and their basic brackets, Poisson brackets, and then you carry them over to the realm of quantum theory by replacing all the Poisson brackets by saying that there's a quasi correspondence. Poisson brackets are associated with the commutators divided by i h bar, for instance. Well, so in certain books, it, this is the approach adapted. It, as we are following the textbook, Mr. Sakurai says, well, let's not go through that. Oh, that's perfectly all right, perfectly acceptable. Nothing is wrong with that. But whatever approach you adapt, you have to stick to it from the beginning till the end. You cannot shift back and forth. So uh, I just wanted to comment that, that that's the likely approach. And I'm not going to get into the detail apart from the fact that perhaps at some point when I come to the difficult issue of identifying the generator of the translations in space with the momentum, there will be a need of introducing some fundamental constant to match the dimensionalities of the generator of the translations and the momentum operator, their purpose we may briefly refer back to the classical Poisson bracket formalism again. But as I said, I don't want to exaggerate on that. So let's see what do we mean by that. Remember, I have been talking about symmetries and conservation laws in physics. That is a very important issue. Well, that's at the foundation of relativity, whether it's the non-relativistic Galilean version or relativistic Einsteinian version, there is one common postulate of the principle of relativity that laws of physics are the same in all re inertial reference frames. The distinction from between the Galileo and Einstein comes at the level of speed of light, but that's not the issue. I'm not going to get into that. Well, so invariances play an important role, invariances and covariances. Invariance the value is preserved, as we will see. Translation invariance in physics is associated with the conservation of the momentum. The value, the mathematical value of the momentum is conserved in a process. The incoming sum of momenta and outcoming sum of momenta in any process are the same. That's invariance. Value doesn't change. There's also covariance. Laws of physics are the same in all reference frames. Laws are the same. They look the same. So they describe similar phenomena. So we have to really understand this issue. So this particular principle is quite well known. There's, if there's a symmetry and there's a conservation laws. 
is the conservation law. Space translations, momentum conservation, time translations, energy conservation, space rotations, angular momentum conservation, and that all the way through. But notice that there is no conservation associated with the position. I keep going back to that issue so that I challenge you to think a little bit about it. So you may say, what is the sacred role of X together with B? We don't know. That's historical accidents, if you want to call it that way. So let me start introducing the translation in space. I think this is always to be <coughs> emphasized that this particle translation is in space. Let's start for the uh, benefit. Well, he doesn't do that. I could have done it in the three-dimensional, one-dimensional case. But as the book goes through the three-dimensional full notation, let's do, let's, uh, do the same. We define the translation in the space in the following manner, let's introduce an operator, curly T, for the translation, obviously. And we may, uh, I don't like this notation, but let's keep following the book's notation. So let's consider an infinitesimal one. T of dx. Uh, there are equivalent, perhaps, uh, relations that you may say you can put it in the sub-index like this. There, these are notations. I don't know. This is the book's notation. There is a sort of danger of misinterpreting it as a t operator times dx. It's not the case, of course. This is just a notation. So the, the infinitesimal, this is an infinitesimal one as indicated by here that we are, we are at a point like this. And here is the coordinate frame, if you want. This is the x, and that is the dx, and you shift to another point, that's x plus dx. If you want, that is what you mean. What is it in real life? What do I mean by translation? Take the two universities, Metu and the Hajatepe, for instance. They are at two different positions, locations at the, in a given reference frame, right? So if you're really comparing these two laboratories, one in Metro, one in Hajatepe, you are saying that this is really the translated in space laboratories, and you compare the physics at these two laboratories. Do they, do they happen to be the same way? Yes, they do happen to be the same way. If you drop a uh, ball, it reaches the ground in the same time. Similarly, if it is the same identical pole, it doesn't change from one point to another. So translation is this. One point in here, another point in here, they're in an, the same inertial frame, and you would like to compare uh, what's going on in here. So how do I define this? I define this definition in the quantum mechanical sense, that's pictorial representation. We say, let's take this and act on the position eigenvector. Well, it's the most natural uh, thing to resort to is the position eigenvector, right? Because if you, that picture is telling you that you change the positions from one to another point. That's the definition, an infinitesimal case, x plus dx. So we define this operator in this manner. Once we defined it, of course, we may uh, uh, there are several things, of course, uh, that we have to... One observation is that x, this x is not an eigenvector of this operator. That's an important thing to notice. So x is not an eigenvector. You may say why it's relevant. You'll see why that uh, statement will be relevant. Eigenvector of to be an eigenvector, tau acts on it, and it changes at most by a phase. You should recover the same vector. If we don't recover the same vector, we recover something else. So obviously, it induces a change. Another thing is, how does 
the translation operator acts on an arbitrary state if you want. Let's start discussing it, okay? So I, I may introduce some notations slightly different than the book, but that doesn't matter. So, okay. So consider now an arbitrary alpha, an arbitrary state. Now we are interested in finding how this state is translated. Well, I denote it with a, a sub, uh, suffix tr, meaning translated state. Of course, it is defined in the usual manner. Now, uh, we are interested in constructing the properties of this T operator defined in this manner. First of all, we have to consider the transformation of the associated bra in the dual space, which is alpha TR is alpha T as before, in the, as we have discussed in the general formulation of quantum theory. So the first property that we will consider, we have to impose is the preservation of the normalization. Preservation of the normalization. That is, this state alpha, which we have started with, if it is normalized, it should be quantum mechanically, then this translation shouldn't change this normalization. It should preserve it. That is, I require alpha TR and alpha TR to be the same as the before, the starting normalization. Well, for physical reasons, we set it to be one, but it is more than, what is more important is that it is, whatever normalization is, it is preserved. Now, if I substitute those definition in here, then I get alpha T transpose T alpha is equal to alpha and alpha, which obviously tells me that this T should be unitary. So the, f the, f the first, pr first is the unitarity which follows from the preservation of the normalization. Now there are several other properties which I have to Consider the second property is the so-called group property. The group property. That is, two combined translations is equivalent to a single translation. That is, if I go from A to B via a dx translation and then a dx prime translation to C, I could also go to, from A to C directly by a, a combined translation. If I write this, it, it, it becomes tau dx and tau t, actually. I will keep calling it dx prime is dx plus dx prime. Okay, so this is the second property, which is self-explanatory on the basis of this picture. The third is, third is uh, the inverse, uh, the, the, uh, the existence of the inverse, which is, I write the mathematical expression, minus dx is the same as well, that is what we define as the inverse transformation, dx. Again, understanding this in the context of a diagram is easy. If you go from A to B via a dx, you can go from B back to A. Well, that obviously will, be, will involve the reversing of the dx. 
So therefore, the, this is the inverse, going from B back to A. If you go first A, B, A to B, then B to A, these two combined transformations equivalent to identity. Obviously, the second one should be the inverse of the first one, and it's related to the minus dx. So it is self-explanatory as well. And finally, there is a th fourth property, which is limit of when dx goes to zero, dx is the identity, which is again self-explanatory because if you, if there is no dx, if you sh shrink it back to, if you shrink delta x to zero, it means b is shrunk back to a, so there is no translation and that is, so it must be an identity. So next we will combine these four properties to construct the infinitesimal translation operator explicitly and we'll use it so you'll see it's going to be a very nice construction. So let's see whether we can use those properties to construct the infinitesimal translation operator. Construction of Dx, that's to emphasize that it's the infinitesimal. Well, the very last one tell you, tells you that it should differ from an identity by an infinitesimal amount proportional to the dx itself, because if you let dx go to zero, it should reduce to one. So the leading term in this is, is one. And there must be also some terms which is proportional to dx linearly so that the turning off reduces to this one. Good. So as the dx enters here explicitly, we have to introduce a k operator to be constructed eventually, uh, to be identified with some kind of physical operator eventually. If I leave it like this, then if it is unitary, and this could be unitary, but if I put uh, an i, then I turn it into, I turn it into, uh, this is infinitesimal, sorry. If it is unitary, it would be her mission. Uh, now this is her mission. And for the convention, I define this, def, and I, as I said, I'm free to put the sign as plus or minus, up to me because that really, this is an unknown operator yet. It affects this one. Whichever sign you put, you get the opposite sign from the previous case, right? If you, I choose plus, then I get the opposite sign for the whatever I'm going to obtain at the end of the day. I could drop the i, which is up to me. Then whatever feature I have in here will be slightly different, but which is an identifiable feature. Okay, question. Is this in agreement with those four features, four lemmas, which I have extracted from physics? Well, the uh, unitarity, for example, is it guaranteed? Let's check the unitarity. Check. Unitarity. Tau dagger. Tau is one plus perhaps I should make you one uh, these are K's are in this way K's are her mission so with that choice of her mission K's let me indeed demonstrate that this tau is uh, to this order infinitesimal order is unitary. So if, if I chosen this Hermitian, then the tau dagger becomes i dx times k. Notice that it's Hermitian, so k dagger is itself. i, the second factor is the tau itself, so let me copy it here, dx k. So let me expand this. The leading term is 1. And there are cross terms i dx k minus i dx k 
0 plus second order term k. But notice that this is the infinitesimal written to first order, so these are out of consideration. So to the infinitesimal order, it's indeed unitary choice of her. Otherwise, I could have, for instance, demonstrated that k dagger minus k should, to satisfy the unitarity, I should set this equal to zero, right? The first order term. So it is, these two approaches are identical. We choose the first one, we say, we choose them her mission and demonstrate that it's unitary, or we choose them to be arbitrary and require that it's unitary and come up, come up with the result that it is her mission. Okay, two identical ways of demonstrating the sign. What else? Uh, indeed, in the limit of dx goes to zero, it's identity. When you have, by the way, let's combine the two different things and demonstrate that it's indeed a single thing. So how do I demonstrate to the, what, prop, what, what was the number of that property? It was that. So it's a trivial matter, right? When you add dx, tau t dx and t dx prime, everything is common, dx plus dx prime adds up immediately satisfy that property. The inverse is, that's also obvious. If you take the inverse, and then it's the minus thing. So indeed checks, all of them are checked. Some of them are by construction, some of them by quick check. So caves are Hermitian, that's the crucial point. Now we will uh, uh, see how does the, let me write the translation of, definition of translation, and let me act on it by the position operator first. So what do I get? X Tau, let me suppress the TTX depends. I know that it's the infinitesimal one, so to simplify the notation. Now I'm using the eigenvalue equation for the position operator. So this further right hand side is this. So it was starting with the translation definition. Now, let me, that's the first line. Let me define with this. Let me start with the eigenvalue equation. I, the first one was the translation equation. I acted on it by the X operator and got something here. Then I'm the starting with the eigenvalue equation for the position operator, and I act on it by the t. So left hand side is t, x, and x. This is a number that's an operator jumps over and acts on the x and write the translation. You see what I'm trying to get at? I'm trying to find the commutation relation between the translation operator and the position operator. Therefore, it's natural that I follow this line of reasoning. First, the translation equation acted upon overall by the position operator. Second, the position eigenvalue equation acted upon by the translation operator. Left hand sides are x and tau and t, t and x, they are different, but what about the right hand side? The right hand side is also somewhat different. Let me do the following. Let me subtract side by side. The left hand side is x, t, commutator of the position operator with the translation operator, and right hand side is notice that x is cancel and there is this, this, this term survives. 
dx x plus dx a rather uninteresting looking equation really you notice know, that there's not much to much enlightening about this so what I would like to do next is uh, elaborate a little bit in the right hand side notice that this is an infinitesimally shifted state vector multiplied by that infinitesimal shift itself obviously in the right hand side there will be a leading term of proportional to dx, a second term proportional to the dx squared. Let me demonstrate that and recalling again that this is an infinitesimal operation so we have to retain terms of linear order only and then we'll see what kind of uh, if it, mathematics or uh, interesting results would follow from there. How do I elaborate on this x plus dx? Let me do it in here so that it, it is visible explicitly. It's an interesting and fun mathematics there. So what is the x plus dx? Well, you Taylor expand, and this is a cat vector. You Taylor expand the same way. So the Taylor expansion goes x plus dx d by dx or del of x determined at this point. I hope you are comfortable with this kind of expansion. Whatever you do as far as Taylor expansions are concerned in relation with functions, you apply it here to the state vector. I will stick to a, a different notation now. If you want, you can write it as dxj del j if you want. You'll see the reason. So let me go back to that uh, equation there and let me go to the, let me shift, restore to index notation. It is xi capital T dxi this whatever index has this dx has it is as same as the capital X operator so i and i and the expansion of the cat, which is x plus dx j del j and x. I keep writing x arrow, meaning x1, x2, x3. Remember, position operator, different components of position operator commute. All the three have a common set of eigenvectors. Therefore, all these three labels should appear at the same time in the state vector itself. The original, the prefactor might be one of the one of the x1, x2, x3, but the, the vector contains the three index together. Compatibility means all simultaneous of all the three position operator components. So what is this? Well, I put this sign because this is expanded. There are this is the infinitesimal that's leading order. Therefore, use this inf. These are all infinitesimals. To leading order. So the first term is dxi x, second term is dxi dxj dj x and all the higher third etc. These are all dx squared. So leading order infinitesimal to the desired order what I get is this. Sorry, here, I apologize. I, I dropped those vectors. Of course, they, they should be there. Sorry about this. Notation-wise. OK, so as these are arbitrary state vectors comparing the first, just key, retain the first term in the right-hand side, and that's the left-hand side. As x's are arbitrary, arbitrarily chosen out of the infinitely many eigenvectors of the position operator, then you collect everything to the left and write it something acting on the x equal to zero 
it is arbitrary, so this holds as an operator equality. Okay, <clears throat> so what else? We are more or less there. We have to remember that this was constructed in terms of the, a set of unknown yet Hermitian operators K as such. That was our definition. We are carrying out infinitesimal translations and that is the explicit expression we have constructed for it. I is the identity operator. It commutes with anything. Therefore, X comm it, it, it commutes with the X. So what is left over in the left hand side is I dx j x i k j is the x i infinitesimal. Now I put the infinitesimal and then I don't I don't have to put the approximate sign anymore. It's it, uh, infinitesimal order. This is the expression. The xi is an infinitesimal again shift in an arbitrary i direction. Therefore, in order to uh, use this arbitrariness of the amount that it's infinitesimal and the arbitrary direction, to be able to compare with that, I write it as delta ij, delta dxj, repeated indices are summed over. That's our standard convention. I don't write summation sign. j is summed over. And then you collect everything to the left, write the xj times something is equal to zero. The xj is arbitrary, so that something must vanish. So you get the following beautiful commutation relation. I'll use a different color for this. I hope you appreciate the power of the uh, symmetric transformation at this level. So we introduced the translation operator and we define its role on an arbitrary basis vector of the position operator. Then introduce a set of three K, uh, Hermitian operators K and just that using the definitions we introduced that K satisfy a commutation relation of this sort with the position operator. Remember I was talking about the correspondence with the classical physics saying that we have a Hamilton Poisson formulation. We have algebras in terms of canonical pairs, Q's and P's, so that QI, QJ is zero, PI, PJ is zero, QI with PJ is delta IJ. Everything is real there, right? And dimensions, of course, we know what the, are the dimensions of a position and momentum. Momentum has the position mass times the velocity. So it is m l t inverse, whereas x is l. So how do you match the dimensions? Of course, you have to introduce appropriate fundamental constants here at constants. These are commutators, perfectly com common commutators that we introduced. And now correspondence is needed because I haven't really introduced any kind of canonical commutation relations yet. We are having a constructive approach so using basic principles, referring to measurements. Stengerbach was one of the most crucial experimental devices which are leading the way for us. So if I say I compare this with the basic canonical commutation relations of X with P, you may say, how do we know the basic canonical commutation relation of X? We don't know it yet. We are sort of trying to introduce the momentum via this beautiful argument that it's a generator of the symmetry. What is that symmetry? Translation symmetry. That's what I'm doing. So we say, if I identify the K based on that correspondence principle as Capital letters are for the operators, remember? H has the right dimension. 
What was the dimension of the k I introduced, remember here? The dimension of the k is inverse length. Because this is dimensionless. That is inverse length. L inverse. If I divide it by the dimension of action, it is then what? Mass times mass divided by mass divided by t. So it is indeed the h bar. It has it carries the correct correct dimension to compensate. We know what what is the dimension of p? Let me remind you. M l t inverse. What is the dimension of this that we started with? L inverse. Okay. So in order that both everything should match, what is the dimension of h bar? h bar should have the dimension of m l minus 2 t minus 1, l minus 2 t minus 1, no, l squared t minus 1. Indeed, action has that dimension, right? mv squared integrated over x. So this is a good identification consistent with the correspondence principle and consist with the consistent with the corresponding Poisson brackets, although I'm not using them, I use it as a supportive argument. And there is a half a page discussion in relation with other things like these electric charge dimensions, how they are different the unit systems and etc. why there are 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 in one case in the Coulomb equation and in the other case it's just 1, etc. So it is a question of dimensions. I'm not really interested in that discussion. I invite you to read on your own. So we identify this as the momentum operator divided by the h bar. Therefore, the, let me, before the break, let me write this. Finally, I will move away a little, if, if you'll be patient, just a second then the infinitesimal one becomes this. I, okay, be, let me be careful with the notation. P is now the operator which satisfies the following commutation relation okay so that's how I introduced to P P divided by H bar is identified with K the first one followed from the translation uh, mathematics the second one is what how we establish contact with the physics and it's indeed very similar to the Poisson bracket. X with P is, remember, delta IJ. And we said the correspondence between the quantum commutators and the classic Poisson brackets, commutator divided by IH bars are the ones corresponding to Poisson brackets, which is, again, consistent. I think that is a good point to give a short break. Uh, then uh, we will see what else we can extract from this translation issue in relation with the commutators of the momentum, but anyway, I'll go back to it.